Let's continue with the endocrine system and take a look at the pancreas. When you look at the pancreas and its location, you'll see that it's found posterior to the stomach. In other words, just behind it and in the upper left quadrant of the abdominal pelvic cavity region. This pancreas, like a few other organs, is also retroperitoneal, meaning it's behind or outside of the peritoneum. Most of the organs in that body cavity aren't. And the pancreas is also a mixed gland. Remember, if any gland is mixed, that means it's endocrine and exocrine. If it's endocrine, it has to have at least one hormone, which it does. And if it's going to be exocrine, it must have a duct. And it does have a large duct running through the center of it. Now, the pancreas with its two major hormones, insulin and glucagon, are the major regulators of your blood sugar levels. Now, there are many hormones that affect your blood sugar levels, but these are the two biggest ones. So look first at insulin. Most people have heard of this one right here because many people have trouble with it. We'll see why that is in a minute. But insulin will target most all cells of the body. It's going to tell almost all cells of the body when they can take in glucose and amino acids. Most cells won't do this until the insulin is present. But insulin does not affect neurons. Neurons are the most active cells in your body because they're so active, they're constantly consuming glucose, so they can't afford to wait on insulin and tell them when to do it. Insulin might have a minor effect on those neurons, but not much. But when you look at other cells of the body, they need this insulin before they'll take in these nutrients, glucose and amino acids. Think about skeletal muscle. That's a big target tissue because that's probably around 40% of an adult's body weight right there also targets the liver. The reason being the liver is a big energy storage site. You eat a big meal and you've got some excess glucose floating around in your blood that other cells don't need at the moment. The liver can definitely store them up and it will do it in the form of glycogen. Another big target tissue for insulin are adipocytes. After the liver has taken up sugar and stored it up in the form of glycogen, Fat cells or adipocytes can take it in and store it up in the form of fats and lipids. So those are all big target sites right there, but again, most cells of the body are target tissues of insulin. Another place insulin will work is on the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus has many functions, but one function that's there is the satiety center. That's your hunger center. So by monitoring insulin and blood sugar levels, the brain tells you when you're hungry. Even though insulin doesn't lower your blood sugar levels, right? You always hear about insulin is used to lower your blood sugar levels. No, that is not the function of insulin. It does lower your blood sugar levels, but that's not its function. Its function is to tell cells when to take in the glucose. So don't get those two things confused. And think about when insulin would be released. Well, it tells cells when to take in sugar, especially your big storage sites. So say you've eaten a big meal, you've got a lot of excess glucose and such floating around in the blood and body, that's a good time to tell your storage sites to take it in, and of course skeletal muscle and other things like that too. Now glucagon does sort of the opposite of insulin right here. This one's job is to raise your blood sugar levels. Now notice how glucagon doesn't target most things in the body like the insulin does. It targets largely your liver, and your fat cells, your adipocytes. Reason being, these are your big energy storage sites. So glucagon is released when your blood sugar is low. Think about if you've gone through the day and you haven't eaten for several hours, or you've been out exercising. Obviously, that would lower your blood sugar levels. When they get low, glucagon is released, and it tells your liver and fat cells to release its stored energy back out into the blood. And of course, that would raise them back up. And notice how the words glucagon, glycogen, and glucose are all so similar. Glucagon, again, tells the liver when to re release glycogen. Actually, it tells it to break it down back into the form of glucose. So all three of those are tied together right there. But again, neurons aren't affected by glucagon either. We mentioned that with insulin, and you definitely would not want glucagon to affect the neurons, because if neurons ever started releasing stored energy, a person would not live for very long. But anytime you talk about these hormones, you almost always at this time hear about diabetes. Now there's three big forms and we've got three categories and there's lots of smaller categories under these, but these are the big ones. Now the first one you see at the top, diabetes insipidus is really rare. You'll probably never meet anybody with this one. 
But this is where someone has a problem with the hormone ADH, which we looked at in a previous video. Remember, diuretics cause you to lose water. Antidiuretic will cause you to hold it. So with the several forms, let's say one of them is when a person's not producing or releasing ADH. If you're not producing or releasing ADH, or maybe the kidneys won't respond to it, the person's going to be losing way too much water. And that can lead to big problems with homeostasis. But what you're always hearing about is diabetes mellitus. Here's where someone has trouble with insulin. You've probably heard of that before. And the two big types of diabetes mellitus are type 1 and type 2. With type 1, this is also what's called juvenile diabetes because it often hits a person in their early years, often before they're out of their teens. And this is also called insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus because these people have no insulin in the body. They have to inject it. Now, type 1 is going to be caused by an autoimmune disease. Somebody gets an autoimmune disease, that's basically where their body has destroyed something it shouldn't. Often this happens after exposure to some type of disease, some type of foreign antigen gets into the body. When the body produces an antibody to destroy that thing, it'll sometimes destroy something it shouldn't. And in this case here, the body has destroyed the cells called pancreatic islets. And if those cells get wiped out, there's no more insulin in the body because that's where the insulin is made. So notice this right here is pretty rare. Only accounts for about 3% of all diabetes cases. But what you hear about all the time is type 2 diabetes mellitus, the adult onset. This usually comes about later in life. Often you didn't see this in a person until they were at least in their 40s, but it's happening to people at earlier and earlier ages. Now this right here is not an autoimmune disease. This is caused by a person's lifestyle and diet. In short, people are eating way too much and they're not exercising. Now think about what's going to happen. If somebody's constantly taking in calories and not burning them off, they're going to keep their blood sugar levels high. And when blood sugar is high, that's when insulin is released. So when they keep their blood sugar high, they keep their insulin levels high. And if they do that, over time, the cells of the body will become tolerant to the insulin. In other words, they tend to start to ignore it. Think about this with other chemicals put in the body. Often with the first dose, a small amount is all that's needed. And over time, more and more and more, same thing's happening with insulin. And notice this accounts for almost all cases of diabetes, somewhere around 95 to 97%. And this should never happen right here. Right. Again, this is caused by lifestyle and diet, one of the biggest health care problems in the world today. None of it should ever be happening. There's links to my books as before.